It's possible that I'm really insecure and I needed everyone to applaud. <clears throat> Actually, I'm not insecure at all. I think my wife wishes I was a little more insecure. Um, <clears throat> I told them to put this three foot back because obviously you can see that there's two chairs up here, so I'm not gonna be up here alone, but I'm gonna do the introduction alone so that person is not sitting there staring at me, feeling awkward while I'm sharing. Um, anyhow, let's pray. Lord, we, just, uh, we thank you, Father, for your presence in this place and in our hearts and in our lives. Um, Lord, but there's... We, we know that you're in us and that wherever we are, you are because you're, you're in us. Uh, you reside in us. We're, we're your temple. We, we become the temple of the Holy Spirit, so your presence is with us. But there's something unique when your body gathers together. There's a unique, unique sense of your presence. If all of us have the Holy Spirit, there's got to be like some critical mass thing that happens on a Sunday morning. We feel it. We feel the energy in the room. We feel the excitement in the room. There's that corporate anointing that is present. Uh, the body gets to operate with all the individual giftings that we have, and it's just, it's just an awesome experience. And uh, Lord, we, we just can't, we can't replace that. Again, we know that you're wherever we, we go, but when we gather together corporately, Lord, I just pray for all those that are disconnected from the body of Christ. You know, you can't, you can't really be a part of a church online. You can't. You can get taught, you can get ministered to, you can get prayed for, and you can even receive healing through those prayers, but you cannot become part of the body because it's not reciprocal. It's them just receiving teaching, but we don't know that they're there. I mean, they, they might be able to send us, send us a message, but we don't really know them. Lord, I just pray for all of those that aren't connected to a body, whether it's here or someplace else, they need to be connected to a body. And Lord, we're, we're living in a time and a season where, where people are just so disconnected and they're craving significance in relationship. And Lord, we, we don't become who we are until we become connected to the body of Christ. And that body of Christ is, is those local congregations. That's how it's represented. So Lord, fit them together with a body. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, <clears throat> I've entitled this, this message bridging the gap, and I'm going to need help bridging the gap between my introduction and the real body of the message, um, because when, when the Lord gave me this scripture verse, it, it, well, at first it didn't seem like it fit. I can see how it fits now. Um, it's in 1 Chronicles 12, 32, and uh, I'll just read it to you. It says, of the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, their chiefs were 200 and all their brethren were at their command. There was this tribe, one of the 12 tribes of Israel was the tribe of Issachar, and it says, it says that they knew the times and the seasons, and they also knew what to do. And I really feel like, while I'm sure you've heard this passage of Scripture before, you've heard of the Issachar anointing, I've heard many prophetic words about it, um, and this has been declared over many seasons, probably at many times, that this is the, these are the times of Issachar. But there's an anointing, there was a special gifting in these sons of Issachar that I believe we desperately need in this season. Um, they say, they say that, that the world today is growing 10 times faster than it did just 50 to 100 years ago. Um, culture, is, culture is changing, people, people are changing. We've been talking about the different generations. I, I kind of launched it off about talking about passing on the, the baton. I'm, Generation X, and then we had Andrew speak last, last week, and he's the millennial generation. And Natalie, my daughter's going to share a little bit today. I'm going to ask her some questions, and she's going to speak into what I'm talking about. And there's this Generation Z, which we're going to spend the majority of the time talking about. But um, just thinking about the generations and how fast culture is changing, I mean, think, think about this. I mean, you've heard these analogies. The, the cell phone, your cell phone, that used to take up the size of a room. The sort of operating system in that phone used to take up, I mean, the first computers took up rooms, huge, and then they got smaller and smaller. Just think how much things have changed in just the past 50 years. I mean, I'm 50 years old. I did not grow up with a cell phone. I got a cell phone after I was married, and it looked like a brick. Remember the brick phones? 
I mean, that was my first, forget flip phone. I mean, my kids made fun of me with flip phones. I had a brick phone, it didn't even flip. It had an open, open keyboard and it looked like a brick. I mean, you know, now you have kids growing up with technology everywhere. It's in their pocket, it's on their, it's on their, on their wrist. And we, and we think about that just, just, from, just from the standpoint of technology, but there's, there's more to it. Because now they have access to the world at their fingertips. Why do we need the giftings of, like the, the sons of Issachar? Because things are changing so fast, so lightning fast. You need any sort of information, all you got to do is Google it, and you have it. You can be in other countries. Our kids are being ex- exposed to the good and bad that's on, on the Internet. You know, most of the relationships are through the digital world. I mean, they, they have more friends on, on Facebook and Instagram than they have in actual friends. I mean, they would say, call these people their friends, but they haven't even touched them, physically seen them. It's been on a computer screen. So things are changing. And we know that things are changing in the culture and things are changing in the world. And if, if the church needs anything right now, it's wisdom and understanding of the times that we're living in. The reason why we've been talking about the generations is because the church in, in Western culture is losing ground because they do not understand the times. And they're not shifting with the times. As I've been reading about the different generations, um, I, I, I've been finding some really troubling articles. And I've been really troubled about, you know, where, where I'm at and where, and where Bethel, where we're, where we're at as a congregation. If we don't understand the times, we won't have an impact on the culture that we can have, that, that, that we should. If we don't understand the way people think, the way they act, the way they build, they build relationship, how are you going to ever reach them? I mean, one of the jobs of a missionary when they go into another country is what? What's the first thing they have to do? Well, preferably... If they're long-term missionaries, they're going to do this before they get there. But learn the language. Learn the language and learn the culture. Ten times the world is, cha- is changing ten times faster than it did just 50 years ago. Some say, some say even faster. We have to learn the language of a new culture. We have to learn the ways that we re- they receive information. These seem like, like well, they're, they're, I mean, sometimes I think about that. Is it really that important? Yeah. It's really that important. When you read the, 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 the different articles about the, the diminishing generations in the church, how will the church survive in Western culture if you don't know how to communicate the gospel to someone? I mean, the, the way that they receive information is so different than the way that I received the information just 50 years ago. I mean, there are people that have thriving churches, and they're online churches. I'm not poo-pooing online churches. I mean, it's a great way to get the gospel out. It can never replace the tangible rep- representation of the body, the body of Christ. But so much can be done through social media and online. And, you know, even, even here at, at Bethel, it's, it's been a little un- uncomfortable and it's been slow going. You know, we realize that, that social media is important, getting that message of Jesus Christ out to a very new generation. And some of those things that, that exist in that generation, we're, talking, we're going to talk about Generation Z today. I want you to know who the Generation Z is. I have, th- well, I had three of them in my household. I think I, well, I have two, right? No, kind of. They're in transition. <laughs> my daughter's moving out. She's shaking her head. But I have three kids that are part of that gen- uh, Generation Z, which is like 4 to 24. And then I have one millennial, poor Stefan. Where's Stefan? Well, he was here yelling earlier, but he's here somewhere. He's 25. He's, he's my only millennial. So he, he's, he's set apart from the rest of them. But, um, you know, if it, it, it's hard to change. You know it is. If you're 50 and older, you know that it's hard to change, and you don't want to, and you don't think it's that important to change. If you're going to make a significant contribution in culture, in society, in your church, you can never have the mindset that you cannot change. God needs fathers and big brothers and mothers, grandfathers, grandmothers in the faith. If you don't know how to communicate to this new generation, they're going to miss out on the discernment and the wisdom that you have. 
The reason why we're doing these messages on the generations is to maybe kick you in the seat of the pants a little bit. As I've been studying this and reading different books, I've realized how slow I have been in making shifts in my life to accommodate the new generation. I'm, I'm 50. I'm not going to be around forever. I, have, I mean, I have a good, you know, another good 50 years of ministry left. But 50 is gone. 50 has passed. But, but I'm thinking about who do I pass that baton on to? Who's going to follow me? You know, I'm not, I mean, there's, I mean, it'd be great if it was one of my kids. I'll be honest, just be transparent with you. But I don't know if it's going to be one of my kids. They have different callings and different giftings. They have speaking giftings. And yeah, I'm, I'm all for whatever God wants. But if we don't start thinking about that, then, then we're never preparing for the future. You know, what happens when, when a pastor in his 50s, 60s, or 70s either leaves the ministry or dies and goes to be with the Lord? And there's never been effective transitioning. It disrupts the church so much, half the congregation generally leaves when the new pastor is brought in. We have to start raising up the next generation. There's something that I have to, not, I mean, as a father, I've imparted things to my kids, but as fathers and mothers in the faith, there's things that we have to impart to the younger generation. There's things that they have to impart to us. But if we don't understand them, we'll never be in relationship with them. If, if we're never in relationship with them, then we're never going to be able to impart those words of wisdom and discernment. We all know that we can learn things from younger generations. And the younger generation knows that they can learn things from the older generation. But the relationship has to be built. And I believe it's our job to be thinking about this and creating environments where we're drawing, it, drawing the older and the younger generation together. This is not enough. This is not enough. This is a teaching environment where somebody preaches or teaches and you just sit there and stare at us, sometimes sleep. <laughs> I've been so tempted at times. There's a couple people that do it almost every Sunday. Now, I don't see them sleeping unless I'm preaching, so maybe it's just me. Because <laughs> my back is towards you. So I'm going to start to take it personal. I'm looking around. <clears throat> This is why we have to talk about this. This is why it's so important to talk about it. And this is, I mean, just, just me and my kids, I, 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 look at, I look at some of the things that they do and some of the things that they know. I don't understand it. I don't understand why they act the way they act and respond the way they act. It's because they live in a completely different culture than I lived in growing up. It's so different because of technology. They're exposed to so much and we're going to talk about some of those things so that you can be educated and know why they are wired the way that they are. Why they are the way they are. And some of those, some of those characteristics rub us the wrong way. And you have to be patient. And you'll be patient if you understand why they think the way that they think and act the way that they do. It's because it's a very different culture. So I pray that we would understand the times, and not only understand the times, but know what to do with it. That's what the Lord is encouraging us through these messages. Understand the times, understand the culture, understand the mores, the characteristics, the way people build relationships. That's, that's what he was talking about. The sons of Issachar just weren't sitting in the sky looking at the stars and the sun. That's how, I mean, they did literally understand chronological time because they understood that. That's how they told, that's, that's how they can tell time and seasons by looking at the stars and the sun and all of that. But, but they also had words of wisdom. They had prophetic knowledge that God would download them to, so, so that they would understand the times that they lived in because God wanted his kingdom to grow, his people to grow. He wanted the nation of Israel to grow. He wants the church to grow. And if we don't have that type of discernment, that type of wisdom, which doesn't only require prayer and downloads from God, it takes work. It takes, you need to read some books about the different generations. I've learned so much in the past month about reading about the different generations that I know is going to help me 
It gives me keys and tools to effectively communicate the gospel and build relationship with the younger generation. <clears throat> and I love technology. I need bifocals, but when I have my computer, I don't need bifocals because I can make the letters really big. <laughs> See, I'm fitting in with that younger generation. <clears throat> I want you to... Uh, I'm going to quote something. Maybe you've heard this quote before, and I want you to try to pinpoint the generation that I'm talking about or, or that this quote is speaking of. The children now love luxury. They had bad manners, contempt for authority. They showed disrespect for elders, and they love chatter in place of exercise. Their children are now tyrants. They're, servants of, they're not servants of their household. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents. They chatter about and chatter and gossip about company. They eat up all the desserts. They cross their legs and they tyrannize their teachers. Guess what generation that's speaking of? What's that? Millennial? It's actually a quote from Socrates around 400 BC. Why did I share that with you? Because we all say that about the younger generation, about every generation. But they've been saying that since the beginning of time. There's a lot of things that changed. You know, but people, people and kids and young people really don't change, and older folks don't either. We always look down at the younger generation. We have to stop doing that, looking down at that younger generation. Now, as a matter of fact, that younger, duration, younger generation, this is one of the big significant shifts. They know more than you about a lot of things. Their, their teachers are YouTube they get on YouTube. If they need to learn how to do something, I can't tell you how many things that I've learned how to do on YouTube. YouTube is their teacher. They, they know a lot more than we probably do about many things. Not necessarily about life and experience. That's what we can teach them. we got to stop thinking about the younger generation that way. I'm going to invite Natalie up here. <clears throat> Give her a round of applause. <clears throat> So there are some characteristics of Generation Z. One, they're beautiful. Aww. Aww. Aww, shucks. There are certain characteristics that are identified different gen generations, and the Generation Z characteristics are really fascinating. I'm going to have Natalie, my daughter, speak in, into those. I've, I've found there's many, but I've kind of narrowed them down to 11 really significant ones. Um, some she won't have comments for, but we were talking about this earlier, and I said, you know, I think it'd be a really good idea if you spoke into this, and there's something that I want her to do at the end of the, end of the service that's really important. But something, one of the big characteristics about Generation Z is that they're digital natives. I mean, think about this. They, they were born with a cell phone, sucking on a cell phone, <laughs> a smartphone. They've never known a world that was any different. I mean, even, even I knew a world that was, that was different. But Generation Z, they, they, they grew up where everything was accessible on that, that cell phone. It says, while millennials grew up in a tech, technologically savvy and connected world, younger members of Gen Z cannot remember a world without the Internet. They can never remember a world without the Internet. I can remember a world, but I can remember a world with really slow Internet. They haven't even experienced... Oh, actually, we have at our house. We have it, yep. <laughs> because we have DSL, and it's very slow. But they're called the digital natives. This is the world that they grow up around. There's, this constant, there's technology around them everywhere, information everywhere on phones and on, on watches, on, on iPads. They're, <clears throat> something unique about this culture is that they're entrepreneurial and tech savvy. You know, this could almost be a criticism of this culture. You know, they can never, they can't land one job. They're jumping around from job to job. That's the culture they live in. You know, the days where somebody stays with a company for 50 years is gone. And because of that, because they've seen grandparents and they've seen parents lose jobs that they had for 40 years and couldn't find anything else, this is, this is they, they, ha, they don't have like this trust for co the corporate world. And they want to be, they want to be independent. 
So a lot of them happen to be entrepreneurial. So they have all these ideas. They're full of ideas all the time. Some of those ideas we think are ridiculous, but this is, this is them. It's because of the culture that they grew up in. And I'm going to have Natalie speak into this a little bit. It's the most diverse culture that ever has existed in human history. Not just in America, all over the world, but, but we're talking about Western culture. It's the jet last generation that will be majority white. 52%. Last generation. The Hispanic population has grown four times the rate of the total population in 2000 and, between 2000 and 2010. I mean, our country is becoming a multicultural country. This is the world that Gen Z grows up in. Very diverse, and they're comfortable with it. They're 50%, they say around 50% of marriages in Gen Z are currently interracial marriages. They don't have an issue with diversity. That's a huge plus, considering, considering my culture and past cultures, you know, 50s, you know, in the 1960s, they grow up in an environment that is just naturally diverse, and, and it's every day. They don't even think about it. They don't think black and white. They don't, they don't think, they, they think in many colors. That's their perspective. They're very comfortable with diversity. Do you have something you want to say about that? I can say something about that. Yeah. Growing, growing up in this generation, I've been, and going to an inner city church, I've been exposed to many different cultures, races, ethnicities, and it's helped create an environment where there are no walls or barriers when we want to evangelize to people. We're no longer looking at their skin color and being like, I can't talk to them about God because I'm not the same color of skin as they are. And it's given us an opportunity to talk to a whole spectrum of people and to preach the gospel. And we're able to walk into neighborhoods. I'm able to go thousands of miles overseas and live in Indian villages because we don't see color. We don't see different cultures and we embrace it and we're able to walk amongst the people and live life alongside of them. I've noticed that in, in Flower City Work Camp because most of those well, I think all the kids, with the exception of the leaders, are, are Gen Z. They're Gen Z kids. And I'm not, I'm not saying that, that there's immediate comfort being in a different, different environment or a different neighborhood, but, but I see how they interact with, diff, you know, we're the melting pot in the city of Rochester. We have so many different, different immigrants and nationalities moving into n different neighborhoods in the city. Um, but th these kids seem really comfortable working with different people, not even understanding the language necessarily, because some of them don't know the language yet. Um, there's this comfort level in this generation. We can learn something from that, because we didn't grow up that way. Most of us did not grow up that way. They also say that they're less religiously um, identified. In 1966, 6.6 .6 of incoming freshmen reported being unaffiliated with religion. In 2015, nearly one-third, almost 30% of all incoming college students reported not identifying with a particular, particular religion. The, the rate of atheism has doubled in this generation. Um, they, they call them the irreligious generation. They have no religious affiliation. I've spoken to some kids that know nothing of Scripture, the Bible, Jesus Christ. I mean, remember, the Ten Commandments aren't in the schools anymore. Prayer's not in the schools anymore. We have, we have a media that talks, talks about everything else, you know, but, but Christianity. Um, you, and then there's this, this hodgepodge of religion. So there's this skepticism and cynicism about what is truth. We know that. You know, most of, most of the younger culture believes in a relative truth. That the, your truth, you know, that's good for you, but, but it's not good for me. <clears throat> blurry. Formerly distinct lines are now considered blurry. Technology has blurred the lines between home and work, study, entertainment, public and private. I mean, think about that. Your, your parents probably had a job and they went to an office or they went to a work site to, to work. I know so many of the younger generation, younger millennials and Generation Z, they've never known an office building. They work wherever they're at. They work at Starbucks. If you ever go to Starbucks, you'll see the same people there. I, I tend to frequent certain, certain cafes because I use that as a ministry tool so I can get to know certain people there. There are the same people there. Every time that I go there working on their computers, that's their job. They're working from Starbucks remotely. That's this, that's this culture. So they, 
they're transient. Because of that, they're a transient culture. They can do their job anywhere. Anywhere. Inside, outside, anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. This culture is also overwhelmed. In her interviews with teens, her article in Time Magazine, Susanna, with a really funky last name that I'm not going to attempt to pronounce, says that there was a pervasive sense that being a teenager today is a draining full-time job that includes doing schoolwork, managing a social media identity, fretting about, about career, climate change, sexism, racism, you name it. 68% feel overwhelmed by everything they need to do each day. I can't remember the statistics, but there's a significant um, percentage of these Gen Zers that struggle with anxiety and depression. The kind of stuff that, that someone who was older that was feeling overworked because they had two, two, three jobs, they're experiencing that. This generation is experiencing that. You can't minimize it. They're, they're inundated with information and stimulus all the time. <clears throat> They're lonely. Three million adolescents, 12 to 17, three million just this past year, have had a major depressive episode. There has been an increase in anxiety and depression among high school, high school students since 2012. And this upsurge cuts across virtually all demographics, whether you're suburban, urban, or rural. I mean, has this been your experience? Yes, uh, in my high school, at least... More than half of my friends had depression or anxiety, and they were always stressed out about school and work and having a social life. We, we all trying to balance that. It was very stressful at a young age. Growing I mean, up. just think, when we were, we were young, we didn't have smartphones. If, if you didn't want to connect with people, you just didn't pick up the landline, the phone. I mean, or you could just go outside. You're not going to hear the phone ring. It's, it's, it's like our generation could escape that. You can't now. And, and there's this draw, I think we've all felt that, even, even at my age with a smartphone, it's like you got to check your email, you got to check your Facebook account, you got to check Instagram. You know, it's easier for me to control that than this younger generation that is constantly wired in, constantly wired in. Think about the sort of stress and anxiety that, that, that can bring. Also, this pressure, you know, to, you know, I, I wish I had what they had. I mean, the sort of jealousy, the anxiety brought, brought about because you're wishing you had somebody else's life. I mean, just, it's crazy. <clears throat> They're also the most progressive generation. Most Gen Zers plan to get married, have children, and buy a home, but probably much later than previous generations. They're less likely to drink, smoke, and drugs. That's good. Because they've seen what it's done to the millennial generation and the previous generation. Yet they hold more, more progressive views on issues like the legality of marijuana and immorality of same-sex marriage. 33% say sexuality is the way that you feel. I mean, think about what, what, what kids are being taught in the public school system. I mean, you, maybe, you've, maybe you've read some articles about it, but they're, the, the views that we give them are countered every day, everywhere, wherever they are. They have connections with Christians who believe things that are anti-biblical because they haven't studied the Word and they don't know the Word. Something to share about that? We, we have grown up in a generation that is wanting to be all-inclusive of the LGBT community and agreeing with abortion. And there's all these controversial issues. And Gen Zers feel as if there's not a place to be discipled and mentored into finding what we believe. We don't want to be told what to believe. We want to be shown how we can seek that information out for ourselves so we can go into the world and proclaim the gospel as truth and how God would want us to because we are walking representations of him. But in a loving way because you got to remember they're surrounded by people who, again, believe that sexuality has to, has to do with the way you feel, with your emotions. If you feel like a woman, if you feel like a man, then you are a man or, or, or you're a woman. These are their friends. How can they lovingly speak truth to them and still be friends with, with folks like this who are struggling and grappling with these issues? We cannot have the same responses that we had 50 years ago. Well, just stay away from them. Tell them it's sin or, you know, whatever. This is something that we can learn from the Gen Z generation on how to be loving to a culture that's so confused. 
Gen Zers are individualistic. Ann Fisher, Fisher captures the forces that have helped create an individualistic emphasis among this generation. Gen Z is used to having everything personalized for them. Think about this. From playlists to news feeds to products, features of all kinds, they've grown up expecting that. They expect basically the world to cater to them. They can, they can you know, define the sort of music that they listen to and that is sent to them. They can define product lists. So all advertising and all marketing is pinpointed to the individual because Google tracks all this stuff. So they lit, this generation grows up with basically the world serves me and serves my purposes. But they're individualistic. Individualistic is not such a bad thing either, especially if you live in a, in a cultural environment where a large majority of the people are not so good in teaching good things. You know, being in, individualistic is certainly an asset in a, in a situation like that. They have a commitment to social justice. You can speak in, into that. You know, they're, they're concerned about the world. They're concerned about social causes. They're concerned about sexism and racism. They're concerned about the poor and poverty. You know, that's one of the ways, I mean, that's part of the gospel. There are many people out in the world that think it's, it's, it's anti-gospel to be concerned about those things because they hear so much of the church criticizing the poverty and not taking care of the poor. But it's one way that we can walk hand in hand together and do ministry together. My generation, I've noticed, is we want to make a difference in this world. We want to be the change that we wish to see and leave a mark. So we're very servant-oriented. We want to help the poor. We want to go into other countries and proclaim the gospel and be a helping hand. And we can walk alongside with the older generation in order to do that. Um, this is actually exciting to me. They're on this endless quest for authenticity. They want people to be real. That to me is beautiful. Because that's something that we can offer as a church. You know, we can offer authentic, real relationships to this generation. And they're hungry for it. If the church will come alongside them, learn from them, and we... And they learn, they learn from us. They want a seat at the table because they have things that they can teach us. They have things that they can add. They have things that they can help us with. But that's because they want real significant relationship. And if, if the church becomes something more than this, than a Sunday meeting, where we're actually working together, doing ministry together, meeting in small groups, we can provide those authentic, transparent relationships. I wanted to end with asking Natalie a couple, a couple questions. I, I think it's good to get her perspective because she is part of this generation about her, her outlook on, on the world because millennials didn't have such a great outlook on the world, the millennial generation. Gen Zers actually have a more positive perspective on the world because they see the different cultures working together, doing things together. You know, what's just... Share with us, what, what's your outlook on the world as you look at the world today? A positive one. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I've been doing uh, missionary work for the past two and a half years, and I've been wanting to dedicate my life to being a servant of the Lord and, and helping others and trying to bridge the gap between different cultures and religions and bringing Christianity to other people. And every time I go on a mission trip, I come back home, and the Lord tells me, okay, it's time to stay in Rochester. And then I go out again, and I go into another country. And then the Lord's like, all right, come back to Rochester. And then I ignore him again, and I go out, and it's this constant cycle. So on my last missions trip to Moldova, the Lord sent me home early. And he's like, okay, Natalie, you're not listening to me, so you're going to learn the hard way. So <laughs> I got back early from my trip. And while I was on my trip, he was just downloading this information to me about my generation and about this city and about Bethel. And we, we are the next generation, and we are being called to go out into the world and preach the gospel and help the poor. And Rochester, Rochester is our missions field, and it's, we're placed here for a reason. And I feel as if I'm placed here for a reason to be in the city and to be a light. 
and to be a Christ's ambassador. And that's just what I'm passionate about, going to the city and preaching the gospel and walking alongside children who need mentors, who need fathers and sisters and grandparents to look after them and walk life with them. How can, how can we, as an older generation, help this younger generation succeed, you know, mm. reach, reach your dreams? I mean, because, I mean, I think you would openly admit you can't, you can't do it alone. No. You need the help from, from the older generation. How, but how can we help make you a success? Well, we, we want mentorship, and we, we want guidance from you, and we want you to partner with us and walk alongside of us and show us what what you have done growing up, because we want to learn from you guys. We understand that you do have wisdom. Mm -hmm. So we just want you to be open and willing to talk to us and meet us where we're at so we can go be the change that we wish to see in the world, because that is what the Lord has called us to do, and we can't do that alone. We have to come together as a family and a body of Christ in order to do that. See, I don't see a big difference between, I know that there's, if you, you look up the definition, there's a difference between mentorship and discipleship. But really, there is not much of a difference. I think, I think we've thought of discipleship from the spiritual element, teaching people the word of God and biblical truth, which is all important. But how do you take that knowledge, that biblical truth, and apply it to your everyday work life? How do you, how do you be a Christ-like example in your, in your workplace? You know, how do you, how do you reveal the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven in, all, in every situation, you know, in your play and in your, in your work? And I think that's something that the older generation can help with. We, we have that, that truth. We've been studying it for a long time. How do you take that truth and live it out um, in, your, in your generation? I want to ask you one more, one more question. What do you think is the greatest challenge in reaching your generation for Christ? I think my generation is looking for something tangible, something that they can see and something that they can touch. And we want to see the transformation that, the, that Christ has on every single one of our lives. We want to see people's faith displayed openly every single day and lived out every single day. We, we, yeah, we, ju we just want something tangible so we can apply it to our own life. And we want to see the transformation that the Lord does when you commit yourself to him. Amen. I'm going to have, I know we don't have many of them in here. But I'm going to have anybody that's part of this Generation Z come, come forward. I'm going, to, I'm going to have Natalie pray, and, and we want to pray over you, but we want to identify you. So if you are from the ages of four, and you're probably not up here if you're that young, to 24, I'd like you to come up front. Be brave. What's that? That would be all of my kids except Stefan. Sorry, Stefan. This is Generation Z. <clears throat> there are a lot more than I expected. This is great. You know, you're, you're looking at future lawyers, attorneys, doctors, plumbers, carpenters. Hopefully there's a lot of carpenters up here. Preachers, ministry leaders, small group leaders. I mean... You're looking at our future. Wow, look at all of them. Where are they all coming from? <clears throat> Aren't you a little surprised yeah. by how many are in here? This is awesome. Yeah, Nancy, uh, Natalie's going to make us a, a very selfish promo right now. Go ahead. We have young adult Bible study next week, and there's a lot of you, so I know you're here. You should come. Right after service. <laughs> this is incredible, isn't it? I'm excited about this. First, I want to I thank you all for, for coming up here. I know that this is not like the most comfortable thing to, to, to do, but the congregation needs to see this because you're the future church. You know, I'm not going to live forever. Your parents aren't going to live, live forever. We need to pass on that baton. We need to pass on what the Lord has taught us, what we're walking in to you so that you can achieve greater things. And that's our expectation, and that's what we prop you up to do. We want you to, to exceed what we have done, what we have seen, 
what we have manifested through our, through our lives. So, um, Natalie, why don't, you, why don't you just pray for them? Okay, Lord, I lift up this generation to you. I pray that you would give them the courage and the strength and the boldness to walk out the calling that you have placed on our life because you have a calling for each and every one of the people that are up here today. I pray that you just give us a heart for the, for the brokenhearted and a knowledge to help others navigate through this life and equip us with the strength to run this race that we, we call our own life and to bring your children back to you. Help us be the direct representations of who you are, Lord. Help us to go into the world and walk out every single day like we are Jesus in skin, Lord. And just give us the love and power that is so deeply manifested within us that we just can't contain it. We can't contain the goodness of who you are. We can't contain the love that you have for your children, Lord, that we just have to proclaim it, Lord. And I pray that you would help us go into this world with an understanding to, to love others despite our differences, Lord. And I pray that, that you would give these people guidance to, to what you have called them to do, Lord, in this life and that they would dedicate every single day to, to living for you. Amen. Being part of that older generation, that, that they're leaders now. They're not going to be leaders. They're, they're leaders now. And I believe that they're leaders in the church now. And we need them desperately to help us, to help us lead so that we're leading together, so that we're leading multi-generationally. It's something that we're developing and we're praying about here. But Lord, we need them now. We need their creative thoughts, their creativity, their wisdom, their discernment, the giftings that you've placed in them. We need them now. So Lord, I thank you for them. I thank you that you've raised them up in this hour. I thank you for the, all these, these, this generation that's, that's standing before us. Just reach your hand towards them. We pray blessing over them. We pray the wisdom of God, like, the, like, like the, the wisdom of the sons of Issachar. We pray that sort of wisdom over them, that you would give them discernment. Lord, that you would give them discernment on how to navigate in this culture. You give them discernment, discerning of spirits. Lord, that you would raise up those spiritual gifts in them. Lord, those spiritual gifts are not just for a church building. They're, 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 they're to help them in life. So, Lord, we just pray that you would raise up those giftings in them and that we would come alongside of them, learn from them, and also in turn that they would learn from us. So blessing and provision. Lord, I pray that your spirit would rise up in them, that you would give them courage in this very difficult season, in this very difficult culture and world that they're in, that you would give them courage to live out their faith, to stand strong on the truth of your word, but most importantly, to do that with love and caring because that it's the love of Christ. It's the love of God that draws men to you. So Lord, just make that ever present in their lives in Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you guys. Give them a round of applause. Awesome. So it looks like they're sticking around. Who wants to preach next? Anybody? What, 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 what was that look? This guy's probably called to be a preacher. That's why he looked at me like that. That's, that's, that's the way I looked when somebody said that I was going to be the next, next pastor at Bethel. I gave them the funniest look. So, well, God bless you. You guys can be seated. Thank you for coming up. Yep. Well, we're going to close the service. We're a little bit over. I thank you for your patience. Um, man, I'm still kind of blown away of how many Gen Zs we have here. Aren't you? Were you surprised by that? It's just awesome. That, that excites me because, I mean, one of the things that, that I was really grieving about is I felt like there were not that many at, at Bethel. And I think that was the Lord telling me, we, we have great seed here. You know, and uh, let us know how we can help you grow in your calling. Um, you know, there's stuff that we know that, that, we, that we can assist you with. Don't be hesitant to, to ask us. You know, we want to become those big bro brothers and fathers in the faith to you. I'm just going to close in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for your body. 
that's represented by all the different ages, all the different colors and creeds. And uh, Lord, you've called this, this, this body that we call Bethel Christian Fellowship together to be a unique rep representation of who you are. And Lord, you are diverse. I mean, there, there's the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. You're diverse in your giftings. You're diverse in your expressions because you express yourself through us. So Lord, I thank you for that. And I just pray, Lord, that you would unite this body. You would unite the different cultures, the different generations, the different ages, the different giftings together to accomplish what you want us to accomplish here at Bethel Christian Fellowship. Lord, you have a destiny and you have a purpose for every individual, but that destiny and purpose is tied up in the body of Christ, in, in, in the congregation, the, the spiritual family that you place us in. So Lord, knit us together because we're much stronger together than apart. We just thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God is good, huh? God bless you. I am going to, we're going to open up the altars as we do every Sunday. If you need prayer, you need prayer of healing, you need physical healing, you're just having some emotional struggles. If you're one of those individuals that we, that we mentioned that struggle with anxiety or, or, or depression or hopelessness, please come up so that we can pray for you. God bless all of you and enjoy the rest of your Sunday.